Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National Coalition for Women with Heart Disease, Raising Awareness, Empowering Women, and Saving Lives webcast. All lines have been placed in listen-only mode, and there will be a question and answer session following the presentation. Simply click on the Ask a Question tab on your screen and type your message into the box. At this time, it's my pleasure to turn the floor over to our host and CEO of Women Heart, Lisa Tate. Lisa? I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight and welcome you all and really appreciate the fact that you're taking the time to celebrate National Women's Health Week by learning more about cardiovascular health and women. I'm Lisa Tate, CEO of Women Heart, the National Coalition for Women with Heart Disease, the nation's only patient organization for women living with heart disease. This educational webinar tonight is brought to you by Women Heart, our organization, and our great partner, Burlington Coat Factory, a partner truly dedicated to women's heart health. I'm also extremely pleased that Dr. Annabelle Vogelman, Medical Director of the Rush Heart Center for Women in Ch Chicago, Illinois, and one of the leading cardiologists in the country on women's heart health is joining us tonight to present this extremely important information to empower everyone on this call and everyone that you speak with afterwards about women's heart health and what you can do to pr protect your own. I'm also really pleased and want to thank Dr. Volman for her many years of service on the Scientific Advisory Council for Women Heart, where she does a fabulous job in advising us on all our policies and all our recommendations and educational programs for women. So we hope you enjoy this presentation. We hope you learn a few things about how to stay heart healthy. And we hope that in the end, we are empowering you to take charge of your heart health. Dr. Volman, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thank you so much, Lisa. It's my pleasure to be here today. Um, we have been um, partnering for the last few years, and uh, it's been such a pleasure to meet so many women who have suffered from heart disease who are doing so well and uh, spreading the word about how important it is to take care of your heart. It is the number one killer of Americans, both men and women. So with that information, let's go to our first slide. I hope everyone can see um, the slide, what we know. Uh, as you know, heart disease is the leading cause of death of American women, and more women than men die of heart disease each year which is not um, a fact that everybody knows, but hopefully by the end of this talk you will, you will know that and tell as many people as you can so that more women will take this seriously. Currently, there are more than 42 million uh, women living with or at risk for some form of heart disease, and more than 8 million women are currently living with heart disease, and another 34 million are at risk. There are a lot of women who die from heart disease. 420,000 women die annually from this disease, nearly five times more than breast cancer and more than all cancers combined. And women are unfortunately less likely to receive treatment according to the cardiovascular disease prevention guidelines. There was a study that showed uh, that women who were presenting with an acute heart attack with evidence of ECG or EKG um, that they are having a heart attack still fared worse than men even though they were um, presenting with it that EKG finding. So it's really disheartening to, to hear about that. <clears throat> the next slide, which shows heart disease is the leading cause of death for women, just to reiterate, there, are, there is a woman dying every minute from heart disease. So you can, you can just imagine that, and um, that's an easy number to think about and take it very seriously because it is a very bad problem. More women than men die from heart disease each year and more overall since 1984. I think we're making some progress with this, but I wear red every day because there are more women than men dying of heart disease. And I, I promise that I will stop wearing red only when there are less women dying of heart disease. So unfortunately, up till today, I'm still wearing red. So hopefully we will make that change so I can start wearing other colors. Um, 351 out of 100,000 women die from heart disease each year. 
one in three women will die from heart disease. I think the easier number to think about is that one woman dies every minute from heart disease. I think that's a scary um, statistic. Let's talk about uh, different ethnic groups, um, African-American women and heart disease. Um, they, are, they are at higher risk compared to other um, ethnic groups, uh, especially Caucasians, and they are less aware of the risk factors. These, um, these factors include obesity. Um, among African Americans, 51% um, are obese and 26% are overweight. In terms of physical inactivity, another risk factor, 64% of African American women don't get leisure physical activity. High blood pressure, a huge risk factor for African American women. I'll talk to, about that later on. Diabetes, 14% um, have diabetes. Unfortunately for women, I'll, as I will tell you in more detail later, diabetes is a worse risk factor for women than it is for men. And diet is very important. Um, Sodium intake impacts high blood pressure, and in people who have heart failure, that's a, another um, big problem. 45% of African women, African American women over the age of 20, have high blood pressure. That's almost half of the population of African American women at such a young age. And I just want to stress this because a lot of women and that age are being put on birth control pills. And birth control pills and high blood pressure can increase the risk of stroke. And that is why we are seeing such high um, uh, rates of strokes in young women nowadays. I think the obesity epidemic has caused that to, to become worse over the um, last few decades. African-American women bear a disproportionate burden of stroke, heart failure, and kidney disease, all due to undiagnosed or poorly controlled high blood pressure. I can't emphasize enough how important it is to get your blood pressure checked. And just because you're only 20 doesn't mean you can't have this problem. So I really emphasize if you are over 20, Please get your blood pressure checked, especially if you're on birth control pills. Get your blood pressure checked routinely. You may not want to take a blood pressure. I mean, you may not want to take a birth control pills if you have high blood pressure, or if you're obese, or especially if you're smoking. Smoking is another big risk factor for having strokes early on um, if you're on birth control pills. Let's move on to the next slide. The Hispanic American women um, have their own risks. Um, they are at slightly higher risk for heart disease than Caucasians as well, and they are also less aware of their risk factors. Uh, obesity is a big risk factor for them. Um, among Mexican American women, 31% are overweight and 45% are obese. They are uh, also more physically inactive, and they also have high blood pressure. Among Mexican-American women over the age of 20, 29% have high blood pressure. Diabetes is a particularly big risk factor for Hispanic-American women. 12% have diabetes, two times higher than Caucasian women. And again, diet is a big um, problem, uh, especially the sodium intake. Among Af Mexican American women, 31% have cardiovascular disease. That's one out of three of these women have uh, have um, cardiovascular disease already. So, big problem. As I promised, I would uh, reemphasize diabetes and its risk for heart disease in women. 10 million women have diabetes. That's a huge number, and 8% of all women ages 20 years and older. That's a huge, huge percentage, especially for these young women. That's many years of having to deal with the uh, ravages of diabetes. 
Unfortunately, there's still more that are undiagnosed. 2.7 million of them are undiagnosed. And 33 million women have prediabetes. At this stage, when your doctor tells you that you're prediabetic, which means that your fasting blood sugar is greater than 100, your doctor should be telling you that you're pre-diabetic and you should start to exercise, lose weight, and eat the right foods or you are going to have diabetes in the near future. This is why we are emphasizing how important this is so that you know that if you, your fasting blood sugar is greater than 100, you should know that your doctor and you should be working together to try to prevent that diabetes. What is the link between diabetes and heart disease? Women with diabetes are two and a half times more likely to have a heart attack. Cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death among people with diabetes. About two out of three people with diabetes die of heart disease or stroke. So when you have diabetes, you not only have to take medications for your diabetes, you need to be worrying about your risk for heart disease. And depending on your blood pressures, depending on your age, your doctor should be thinking about what, what drugs you should be taking to prevent a heart attack or stroke, even if you're, just, even if you're taking the diabetes medication, because the diabetes medication itself will not prevent the heart disease or strokes. Adults with diabetes have heart disease death rates about two to four times higher than adults with di without diabetes. So it's a huge disadvantage for your lifespan and for your quality of life. And, but there, the good thing is that you can prevent diabetes, and um, those things are, you know, physical activity, eating the right foods, and taking very good con good checkups, making sure that your blood pressure and your um, sugars are not getting too high. Next slide shows heart disease and obesity in women. Unfortunately, we have an epidemic in the United States. There are 71 million overweight and obese adult women, representing 62% of women in the United States. These numbers are really scary, um, and we have got to... All, all of us have to do our part in preventing um, more people um, from becoming obese. 32% of Caucasian women are obese and 26% are overweight. A staggering half of African American women are obese and 26% are overweight. And almost as many, 45% Mexican American women are obese and 31% are overweight. The relative risk for cardiovascular disease de increases by 20% in women who are overweight, but if you are obese, your risk is 64% higher. So there's a huge jump in your risk when you cross that threshold of becoming obese. So find out what your um, category of um, BMI is, which is the body mass index. It's very easy to figure that out. You can actually just go on the website, Google BMI, and you can put in your height and weight, and you can figure out whether you're obese, overweight, or um, your ideal weight. So that's very easy to do. Almost half of adult women, 46%, have cholesterol of at least 200. We want the total cholesterol to be less than 200. The increasing prevalence of obesity is, a dr is driving an increased incidence of type 2 diabetes. So the, the obesity and the diabetes epidemic go hand in hand, and that's why we're seeing an increase in both problems. How about depression? How does it affect women and heart disease? It's a big risk problem. It's a big risk factor for women. Um, even mild forms of depression or depressive symptoms can increase heart disease risk. Depression is twice as common in women as in men and increases the risk of heart disease by two to three times. 
and the Women's Heart Initiative, the WHI study, found that women who did not exercise regularly regularly had high blood pressure or diabetes and who reported fair or poor health were more likely to be depressed. There's something about exercising regularly that actually can drive depression down. So that's one of the one of the many good reasons for us to all be exercising on a regular basis. Depression is difficult to diagnose in women with cardiovascular disease and other medical illnesses due to sometimes atypical depression symptoms that accompany heart disease. They won't always um, tell you that they're depressed, so a physician needs to be alerted into what are the other symptoms. And, and so most of the time, they complain of fatigue and just not wanting to do anything, and that should be a sign that there might be some depression involved. Women are less likely to be referred to cardiac rehab, therefore not having access to systems of social support and assistance. I can't emphasize enough how important cardiac rehabilitation is to women who have had heart attack or who have had bypass surgery or a stent or even just an angiogram. They are The insurance company will pay for cardiac rehab and Women are just not being referred to them. And if you are a woman who has just suffered from heart disease uh, or you've just had a heart attack or a procedure, you should be asking your doctor to refer you to cardiac rehab because it will help you tremendously, not only to make you exercise and improve your um, uh, risk factors, but the social support is so important as part of your healing process. So what should you know? Um, know your risks. So important. You can't get treated until you know what your risks are. So here's some, some information about that. The following risk factors can be diminished or possibly eliminated through lifestyle changes. So focus on the ABCs of heart disease. A stands for aspirin therapy. Is this right for you? Not everybody should be taking a baby aspirin or a regular aspirin. Please ask your doctor whether you should be taking um, an aspirin. Uh, a rule of thumb is if you're over 65 years old and you're a woman, you should probably be taking a baby aspirin unless you've had um, some bleeding problems. B is for blood pressure. Check your blood pressure. I don't care how old you are, make sure you know what your blood pressure is on a, on a regular basis. Um, and it doesn't have to be just at the doctor's office. There are many blood pressure monitors out there. So it's easy to check and just get that um, done. C is for cholesterol, high LDL or the bad cholesterol, high triglycerides, and low HDL um, are bad risk factors. So please get that checked. And then the S is for smoking cessation. Um, don't even think about smoking a cigarette. If you are smoking, you have to get rid of that habit. Get help because it's one of the biggest risk factors for heart disease and strokes. Other things that you should also control are your diabetes. Um, if you're sedentary, you need to exercise about 30 minutes every day um, as much as possible, five, at least five to six days a week. And if you're obese, get help with that um, problem. The next slide is um, a special focus on um, blood pressure. <clears throat> As you know, uh, May is a national high blood pressure awareness month and also for strokes. So um, blood, there's a huge correlation between high blood pressure and stroke. Um, Women Heart is putting special focus on blood pressure control as a way to reduce the risk for heart attack and heart disease. About one in three adults in the United States has high blood pressure. The condition itself usually has no symptoms. You can go for years n not knowing that you have high blood pressure. And that's why it's called the silent killer. During this time, though, high blood pressure can damage the heart, the blood vessels throughout your whole body, the kidneys, and other parts of the body. Uh, knowing your blood pressure numbers is so important, even when you feel fine. If your blood pressure is normal, you can work with your um, doctor or your health care team to keep it that way. If your blood pressure is too high, 
treatment may help prevent damage to your body's organs. One of the first things that you should do is avoid salt and start exercising, losing weight, and then um, only if your high blood pressure persists after those changes will your doctor um, have to prescribe a, a, a medication. Um, you can visit this website um, for more information about that. Um, other things you should know. Know your risks um, other than um, the risks we already talked about, such as your age. Um, the older you are, the higher your risk is of having heart disease. But, you know, women can have um, heart disease and uh, risk factors at such young ages that we start to see women who have heart attacks as young as 20 if they have severe high cholesterol. Family history is very important. You need to find out what your family um, relatives um, died of or whether they had um, a stroke or sudden cardiac death so that you can be better aware of what your risks are. Ethnicity and race does play a role, so um, know that that's um, also a risk factor for some things. Um, other things you should know, what are the heart attack warning signs? Not everybody complains of chest discomfort, and most women will not think that it's chest pain uh, that they're having when they feel a heart attack. When they're having a heart attack, they may sometimes think that it's just heartburn. It's usually a chest discomfort. Um, and it could be mild, but it could also be severe, usually um, in the chest. It doesn't have to be in the center of your chest. Usually um, it can last for um, a few minutes, but it can come and go. And other people complain of pain in their arms, their back, their neck, their jaw, um, anything that uh, if you have risk factors and you start to have these symptoms, you need to think about heart disease. One of the most important symptoms is shortness of breath. Whether you have it with or without the chest discomfort, if you start to have shortness of breath and you're not doing anything, like climbing upstairs or doing something exertional, um, that could be a telltale sign that you may be having a heart attack. So if you have risk factors and you start feeling short of breath, please go to your doctor. And if you feel like you're having a heart attack, um, call 911. Some other um, symptoms are dizziness, lightheadedness, feeling nauseated, vomiting, cold sweats. And some people just feel anxious or extremely fatigued. So know, know that these are signs of heart, heart attack. Heart health in the workplace. Many studies show a strong link between chronic job stress and cardiovascular problems such as high blood pressure and heart disease. I can't tell you how many patients I just saw yesterday and two days ago that have severe job stress. And I keep emphasizing to them that it's really, really bad for their health. And uh, unless... Unless I tell them that, they feel that there's no um, relationship. And, and I, I can't emphasize enough how important stress plays a role in your heart health. Prolonged work stress can breed physical inactivity, unhealthy eating, smoking, and other cardiovascular disease risk factors. Women with highly stressful jobs have a 40% increased risk of heart disease. Um, I have actually a one patient who I was complaining of palpitations, and uh, I got a monitor on her. And uh, one of the mon one of the uh, rhythms that that happened was a, a life threatening rhythm. And when I asked her what was happening at the time, she said that her boss was telling her that she needed to do more. And I said, you know what, your job is killing you. And she changed her job. And she is happier than ever because she realized she needed to be told that what she was feeling, um, that her heart was telling her, was that that job was just too stressful for her heart. And it was very dangerous. Um, heart health in the workplace. Try to take a few simple ways to address stress. 
You don't always have to quit your job. You don't have to do what my patient did, but you do have to address it and take charge take charge of that. Um, because it will not be good for you in the long run and not good for your company. One of the simple things you can do is, you know, when you're under stress is take long, deep breaths. These have been shown to decrease blood pressure and have a positive impact on your heart health. Take a break. Stretch or take a walk. Um, just get yourself out of that situation for a little bit. Take a walk. Um, <clears throat> go up the stairs or take a stroll outside. And take a heart-healthy lunch to work because um, bad foods can actually have an immediate effect on your blood vessels. So they've shown that um, saturated fats can um, immediately make your blood vessel not as elastic. It doesn't respond as well. When you need your heart blood vessels to be opened, it won't open up if you have an unhealthy lunch or an unhealthy meal. Take your strategy, give your strategies to other people. Invite your peers to become heart healthier with you so that you can all um, be doing the same thing so that you have um, support in that way as well. What else should you do? Um, adopt habits to lower your risk of heart disease. Commit to a heart-healthy diet. Exercise daily at least 30 minutes a day. Watch your weight. Quit smoking. Know your numbers. Did I tell you enough to get your blood pressure checked? Check your blood sugar. Check your cholesterol and triglycerides. Do this regularly. Know your numbers and talk to your doctor to determine to see if they are too high and you need um, help with that. And again, manage your stress level. Um, also, ask your healthcare provider about your personal risk. Um, so these are some of the questions that you should be asking. What's your overall health risk? What lifestyle you can make? Um, what tests should you be monitored to um, monitor your risk? And um, how often do they need? Everybody's different. If you have a lot of family history, you may need it every year. If you don't have a lot of risk, you may just need it every two or three years. What are your blood pressure, cholesterol, and blood sugar levels? What do these numbers mean? Take these numbers to your doctor so that it personal, it's a personalized risk assessment for you. Um, how much exercise do I need to protect my heart? Depending, again, on how fit you are, your doctor can tell you how much you can be doing. Should you take an aspirin to help prevent a heart attack? Um, again, this is a, a very individualized answer, so ask your doctor. Am I at high risk for heart-related complications if I take birth control pills? I'm glad we have this here because, as I said, if you are on birth control pills and you're obese or overweight and you're smoking, you are at very high risk for stroke, so you have to make some changes. What warning signs should I be aware of? Um, I think we talked about that in one slide, but if you are feeling those symptoms, especially a sudden onset of acute fatigue, chest discomfort, or shortness of breath, call 911. Do not delay. Don't talk to your mom. Don't talk to your sister. Don't call your friends to find out what you should do. Call 911. The earlier you get to the emergency room, the better it is to take care of your heart attack. Remember, time is muscle, so please save your muscle. If you feel like you're having a heart attack, call 911. Tell the emergency personnel and hospital staff that you are having heart attack symptoms because they will respond to that. If you start giving them vague symptoms, they will not respond as well to you. So if you think you're having a heart attack, tell them you're having a heart attack, and they can decide whether you are or not, but you have to help them. Um, do not drive yourself or let your family or friends drive you to the hospital. Don't call 911, okay? Because the emergency personnel and the ambulance can start treating you and start saving muscles. So uh, be careful about that. Chew and swallow one regular full-strength aspirin with water as soon as possible to prevent further blood clotting and possible heart muscle damage. 
Once you're at the hospital, make it clear that you are having symptoms of a heart attack. Ask for a complete cardiac evaluation, including an EKG and a cardiac enzyme blood test. If you really feel you're having a heart attack, you have to be assertive because we have seen women die if they are not assertive about this. Don't be nasty. Just be assertive and please insist that you are taken seriously. <clears throat> what else should you do? Um, protect your heart. Um, lower your risk with the right information, support, and answers. Develop an action plan to lower your personal risk of heart disease. And be a partner with your health care decisions. Um, you should be asking a lot of questions. Talk to your doctor. Um, ask the questions, what is my condition, what should I do, what should I do, uh, why should I do it, and what is ex the expected result. Uh, we're getting to the end. What should you do? Um, get your free online heart health action kit um, at the womenheart.org slash kit um, and learn uh, a lot of information. Uh, I think I am actually should be turning this over to the next speaker. So um, I think I will end my presentation here. Thank you very much. I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Volgman. Um, you know, we are so really honored and to have you with us tonight and for you taking the time. And later, towards the end of the program, we're going to be taking questions from you all that you send in via email to this webinar, and Dr. Volgman is going to be answering those. <clears throat> So, you know, Dr. Volgman ended with saying developing your own personal action plan and asking the right questions. Um, how can you learn to do that? How can you, what else can you do after this webinar, after your participation tonight, to advance your knowledge about heart health and support women living with heart disease? Well, go to our website, womenheart.org, to get all the information that you need. That's www.womenheart.org. You're going to find on there, first, a free online heart health action kit with lots of information that's going to help you as well as all the women in your life. Also, if you're a woman living with heart disease or you know someone who is who'd like to help educate other women and advocate for women living with heart disease, go to our website and apply for one of our free training programs like the Women Heart Science and Leadership Symposium at Mayo Clinic that we hold every fall. And finally, go to our website, womenheart.org, and make a donation. Help support the critical work that we do. Because it is by your generosity and your support and the support of our, our great partners like Burlington Coat Factory and the Heart Truth Campaign that we're able to do the important work that we do and that we're able to advance our critical mission. Our mission at Women Heart is to improve the health and quality in life of women living with heart disease or those most at risk and to advocate for their benefit. We're the only national organization that's solely focused on women with heart disease, and really that's quite incredible because it is the nation's and women's number one health threat. We're the nation's only national organization providing a national network of support for women who already have heart disease, where we work one-on-one -on -one with women and through our support groups around the country to help patients, help them live longer, healthier lives despite their heart disease. And finally, Women Heart is the nation's only organization that is shaping policies on care and treatment of women with heart disease. What we want to do is make sure that every woman has access to prevention, early detection, accurate diagnosis, and proper treatment. So just as like Dr. Volgman said, that every woman gets the care that they need when they need it. So go to womenheart.org and educate yourself. Make a donation to support our critical work. And we're going to move in a moment to the Q&A section, which is really important, where we'll be hearing from you and answering your questions. But before I do that, I want to turn it over for a few words from Heather Human at Burlington Coat Factory and want to give my personal, very special thanks to Heather and Burlington Coat Factory for the critical support that they're providing to Women Heart, which has enabled us, in turn, to help Burlington Coat Factory's customers around the country by providing education and 
on critical heart health issues. So, Heather, would you like to say a few words before we turn it back over to Dr. Volgman? Absolutely. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Dr. Volman, for, uh, for all that you have done this evening. And thanks, most importantly, to all of you for taking the time to learn about the importance of your heart health. At Burlington Co. Factory, we are committed to the communities surrounding our stores and supporting great causes such as Women Heart. As a result of customer donations in all our stores from this past February through our Easter, Burlington is pleased to have donated close to $1 million to support Women Heart in the fight against heart disease in women. This has afforded our customers and the general population with the opportunity to learn about their heart health with programs such as this one this evening, along with other exciting activities, some of which actually took place this past week in concert with National Women's Checkup Day and in celebration of this week, which is National Women's Health Week. To learn more about Burlington Co. Factory, please visit us at burlingtoncofactory.com, and thank you again for caring about your heart health. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Heather, and again, thank you to, for the generosity of, of Burlington Co. Factory and all your customers around the country, and we look forward to continuing to work with you. I'd like to now turn the program over to Chi-Chi, who's going to give some um, more directions on how to um, send in questions, and then we'll hear some of the answers to the questions from Dr. Volgman. Chi-Chi? Thank you, Lisa. So just as a reminder um, to everyone who's on the call, um, your questions can only come in to us via text, not um, via um, verbal communication. So simply click on the Ask a Question tab on your screen and type your message into the box. Um, all of your questions will come in to us and um, we'll provide them to Dr. Volgman um, to answer. So Dr. Volgman, um, do you have some of the questions I've sent your way already? No, actually. Um, I looked uh, in the Q&A. Uh-huh. Okay, got it. Sorry about that. It's okay. No problem. <clears throat> okay. The first question uh, that was asked was, please speak more about the correlation between birth control pills and high blood pressure. This is a very good question. Um, we don't really know the mechanism of why birth control pills increase the, the blood pressure. It's a very complicated um, mechanism because birth control pills it's, themselves are complicated. It's always a combination of estrogen and progesterone and depending on um, the, the patient, um, there are going to be different ways that they're going to um, respond to that. And some people get high blood pressure from birth control pills, and um, and especially if they already have high blood pressure, it can further raise that blood pressure. Um, and as you know, high blood pressure increases the risk of stroke. Okay. Um, next question is: Why does the medical community focus on total cholesterol instead of the entire profile? For example, in a woman with HDL of 99 or greater, you would expect the total to be greater than 200. Since the HDL is so high, the HDL total cholesterol ratio is okay. You are very smart, and uh, I totally agree with you. Uh, um, who asked this question? Um, because Yes, the total cholesterol will go up if your HDL is that high. So I don't actually um, just focus on the total cholesterol. What we do look at to treat is the LDL cholesterol. So depending on your risk, risk factors, we will treat the LDL um, depending on what, um, what your other risk factors are, are uh, you have and whether you already have disease. So if you are um, if you're a young woman with an HDL of 99, but your LDL is also very high, you cannot be complacent into thinking that you're not at risk. So if your LDL is 160 and your HDL is 99, your total cholesterol is going to be very high, and you need to work on lowering the LDL which will further uh, lower also your total cholesterol. The HDL is not a guarantee that you are protected. So actually I was just interviewed today about the study that um, was just published in, in a medical journal saying that um, having an elevated HDL is not as a good a guarantee of good heart health 
as it as we were thinking it is. So please make sure that your doctor is treating your LDL cholesterol and not just um, making you feel that you're not at risk because your HDL is so high. Okay, what are the signs different for Native Americans? Um, Interestingly, Native Americans um, have similar risk factors as Mexican Americans. They have um, a higher risk of diabetes, and um, they need to um, and and uh, people uh, Native Americans who have that metabolic syndrome will likely go on to have um, diabetes. So, um, for for the Native Americans, they need to be aware of the risk for diabetes. Okay, another question is, I'm now uh, pre-diabetic, even though I exercise, eat healthy, and not overweight. I think it is due to my cholesterol or other heart meds. What can I do? Um, That's actually a very good question. Uh, I'm sure that uh, this is pertaining to um, the fact that there's been some recent um, questions about whether cholesterol medications can increase the risk of diabetes. And unfortunately, in some, in a minority of people who are on cholesterol medications, there is a slight increased risk of um, having higher sugars. And fortunately, we have not seen an increased risk of um, heart attacks um, in, in these patients, and it's because of the strong protective uh, influence of the cholesterol medications and heart disease. So if I, um, if, if a patient is worried about that, there are things that um, we can address, such as um, making them um, uh, more um, aware that this is uh, going to be checked um, more closely and um, not to, to stop the cholesterol medication unnecessarily. Um, there are some cholesterol medications that might be better for them, however, if that uh, continues to be a problem. Okay, um, another question is how can you differentiate between a heart attack and gastrointestinal issues or stress anxiety that feels like a heart attack? Um, As I kept emphasizing, if you have risk factors for heart disease, um, just assume that you're having a heart attack because you can die from a heart attack. You will not die from, usually, you will not die from GI issues or stress anxiety immediately, okay? But you can die from a heart attack. So if you have risk factors and you think what your symptoms are can be a heart attack, call 911 because that's the safest thing to do. And work with your doctor so that you're not going to the emergency room unnecessarily. We, we don't want to waste your time, you don't want to waste your time, and you don't want to waste the doctor's or the emergency room's time if this is a repeated problem that doesn't pan out to be a heart attack. So um, work with your doctor closely um, because um, this uh, can, um, can, can be uh, a problem if you're repeatedly thinking that it's a heart attack and, and there's no problem. So, um, but if you have risk factors and you think you're having a heart attack, call 911. Okay. Um, Okay, this is a long question, so bear with me, please. Um, Please separate risk factors from symptoms. Dr. V said several times, if you have these risk factors and you are having symptoms, seek treatment. I think linking these two is why women die die more than men. We're asking women to validate their symptoms with the risk factors before seeking, seeking treatment, and that is dangerous. If most women aren't aware whether they have risk factors by extension, they won't feel validated or empowered to ask for help when they are having symptoms. When experiencing symptoms, whether vague or Hollywood, heart attack, call 91, don't worry about risk factors. Thank you. Okay, that is um, well taken. Thank you very much for that comment. So I think that um, that comment is very valid because, um, of course, you are, who are listening now are all aware of the risk factors, but um, there are many, many out there who are not aware of risk factors. So I. Um, agree that 
um, if you don't know what the risk factors are, um, then definitely um, call 911. Okay, the next question is, I'm a 54-year-old female with coronary artery disease. I have extensive family history, so I have been proactive for the last 10 years. Plant-based diet, exercise, beautiful numbers for my cardiologist. Earlier this month, my total cholesterol LDL and triglycerides rose 10 to 15%. I went on Zola for anxiety three months ago. Uh, for anxiety and depression, could the Zoloft be causing it? And thank you for the comment that it's a great show. Um, I have extensive family. Um, unfortunately, um, as we get older, um, total cholesterol and LDL can tend to go up as we get older. And so no matter how good you are, sometimes it will still go up, and that's why you just really have to stay on top of it. Another another problem could be it's just a lab error. So, you know, if, if it doesn't make sense for your cholesterol to be going up, get it rechecked because it was probably – um, just an error. Um, I don't think it's the Zoloft that's causing it. It's not one of the big, big causes of high cholesterol. Um, there's another um, question. Why are women not referred to cardiac rehabilitation programs as often as men are? That is a very good question. Um, I'm not sure why that is, but um, uh, it's not always the doctor, unfortunately, who's at fault here. Um, it's often the women who are not listening. Um, they're not, uh, they don't feel it's important. They don't think it's, um, they have time for it. They're, they have other priorities. So um, really, we need to work together with the physicians and the patients to try to get um, the women who need the cardiac rehab to get there. Okay. <clears throat> Other um, questions are, what are your thoughts on using resins rather than statins for a patient that has had reactions to do two different statins? How effective are the resins versus statins? So there's a lot of, um, a lot of studies clearly showing the benefits of statins. It not only lowers your cholesterol um, be above and beyond the LDL lowering effect of statins, we also see that there are other effects in your blood vessels and plaque stability that can uh, really decrease your risk of heart attacks and strokes when you're in a statin. The resins are a fallback because you, if only if patients are not able to tolerate the statins will we use those because they're not as effective at lowering your risk of heart attacks and strokes as statins are. So resins can lower your LDL, which will, of course, lower your risk, fact, your risk but there's um, other factors um, that statins have that lower above and beyond the LDL lowering of, your, of the statins. I hope that answers that question. Um, I have, uh, next question is I have one major risk factor and several symptoms of heart disease. I have no health insurance and I'm not a eligible for any programs I know of. Do you have any suggestions on how to get treatment or, or help? Um, <clears throat> First of all, this is um, a problem that I think a lot of politicians are dealing with. We want health care um, for all Americans, and um, there are, um, I don't know where you live, um, but in the Chicago area um, where I am, um, there are many hospitals that will take charity care. If a hospital is a nonprofit hospital, they are by law um, mandated to give charity care for people who can't afford um, the care that um, that they need. So talk to um, the 
um, local hospital that you that you uh, that, that's near you that is a nonprofit hospital and ask for charity care and by law they are um, obligated to help you so I hope that helps you um, next question I understand the risk factors associated with diabetes in Native Americans my question is are the symptoms and signs different okay um, so this is a follow-up question um, Interestingly, um, there are, I, I don't believe that there are any specific signs for um, Native Americans, but diabetes itself can cause different signs and symptoms of heart attacks. So diabetics um, have um, problems also with their nerves, and they don't always feel chest discomfort or chest pain when they're having heart attacks. Oftentimes what they will feel is the extreme fatigue or the uh, shortness of breath. So it's not necessary to have chest pains to think that you're having a heart attack, especially if you're diabetes, if you're, if you have diabetes. Next question, what are the risk factors for women of Mideastern origin or black and or his, uh, Hispanic women? Um, <clears throat> Mid mm, women in Middle Eastern. Uh, so, so there are certain populations, um, especially the Southeast Asian um, region, which may also pertain to the Middle East, where they have low HDL and or another um, lipoprotein, which is another lipid. Um, particle that is not often checked by doctors, but they are in the United States. But they are checked in the in Europe because it's a family. Um, if you have a family history, it elevates this particular um, cholesterol um, that is not usually checked. It's called LP little A. So if you feel that you're at risk because of your family history, um, especially if you're Southeast Asian, and I'm not um, sure, you know, if a specific Middle Eastern area um, have these risk factors also, but, but those are advanced lipid testing that they can check on you. Okay. Um, I have three more questions, um, but I think we have more time. So um, I have, uh, I see I have eight minutes for three questions, so we'll see. Um, one, the first question is, do you prefer one statin over another? I have heard that Crestor is chosen more often. Okay. Um, I don't prefer any specific statin over another, but there are more um, there are some that are more effective at certain doses than others. So let's say Crestor. For a small dose of Crestor, you have a huge change in your cholesterol. So it's the most effective cholesterol medication, and that's why we use it very often. Some people also benefit by getting their HDL elevated by being on Crestor. Um, but it's a, it's a minor um, it's a minor change. But any change in the HDL we believe is beneficial. Um, that that remains to be um, proven, but um, that is one advantage of Crestor. But all statins have the effect of lowering your risk of heart attacks and strokes. So that's the good thing about that. So Crestor is not generic yet, so it is still pretty expensive unless it's in your um, health plan. But now Lipitor and um, uh, Zocor, those are um, all generic now, so it can be very inexpensive to treat your high blood pressure. I mean high cholesterol, sorry. Okay, um, next question is, actually it's a statement, um, thank you, fantastic information or info, especially glad to know about African American and Hispanic American specific facts. Thank you very much for that comment. Okay, with a pace, uh, next question is, with a pacemaker in use, why would a beta blocker be prescribed? Okay, so this is a very specific question, um, but there are a lot of women out there who are taking have who have pacemakers. But um, 
So a pacemaker, it, the only role of a pacemaker is to prevent any slow heart rates from causing any clinical problems. So if you have a pacemaker, its only role is to make sure your heart rate is not too slow. It doesn't prevent any fast heart, it doesn't prevent fast heart rates, which is what a beta blocker does. A beta blocker not only lowers your, your blood pressure, it also lowers your heart rate. So for many different reasons, we prescribe beta blockers. So if you've had a heart attack, we would want you to be on a beta blocker because it will prevent the fast heart rates. So a pacemaker is not a contraindication to a beta blocker. A defibrillator is a different story because a defibrillator can shock your heart and um, treat the fast heart rate. So that's a totally different, um, a different device. But um, you asked about the pacemaker, so that's why I'm answering it in that way. Okay, I have two more questions, and I probably um, that's all we can take for t this evening. Yep. Um, okay, the next question is, please clarify aspirin therapy as part of the ABCs because we have received conflicting information that is not recommended or not useful for preventing heart attacks in healthy women under the age of 65 years old. Okay, I'm glad you asked that question because there is a lot of confusion about aspirin therapy, and it's only now that we are getting some ideas about what we should do for women because for decades we knew what to do for men, but until the studies were done on women, we didn't know. But what we do know is that a baby aspirin over the age, in women who are at low risk for heart disease, so you have no risk factor, you do not need to take a baby aspirin because you will not benefit from it unless you're over 65 years old. But if you have risk factors and if you, um, if you've, or especially if you've already had a heart attack or if you have disease, you definitely need to be on at least a baby aspirin, if not more. Um, I usually just like to prescribe a baby aspirin because it has uh, the same benefit as a regular aspirin without as much GI bleeding. So for women under the age of 65, if you have risk factors and your doctor feels you need to be on a baby aspirin, then I would um, take it. Um, but if you have absolutely no risk factors, you're a, a very healthy um, woman without risk factors, I would not take a baby aspirin. I would do all the heart healthy lifestyle changes such as eating fish, eating lots of fruits and vegetables, hydrating well, and exercising to prevent your risk of heart attack and strokes. Okay, one last question, two minutes to go. Do you know if the stats for heart disease risk factors are different for Canadian women? Oh, that's a very good question. And as far as I know, Canadian women are just like Americans. So, no. Um, you know, Canada is also a very diverse um, country. We, they have many different ethnic groups. So I don't believe that we should distinguish um, the the Canadian women from the American women, but they do have a lot of studies coming out of um, Canada also to inform us about heart disease. So I think we should go by ethnic groups as opposed to um, which country you're from. Okay, I hope that answers all of the questions. I thank you very much for listening and for asking all those wonderful questions. Thank you, Dr. Vogman. This concludes our webcast. I just wanted to remind you all um, that this webcast was recorded, and you can view and watch the recording um, by going back to the email that you received after you've registered and clicking the URL, um, and you will be able to watch the recording um, at your leisure, and you can also forward that email to friends or family that were not able to join us. Um, we thank you again for participating in this webcast, and have a great evening. Thank you.